last time you thought or said, what's the point? Those seemingly meaningless tasks that seem to take your energy in your every day-to-day -day life, knowing that you were made for more. Well, what if God had a plan for those tasks? In 1 Samuel 9, 1 through 3, Saul was sent on a task that eventually led him to become king of Israel. But first, he was sent on a mission by his father to go find donkeys that were lost. He was going to be a ruler, but was first tasked with a servant's job. Obedience in the little things led to much bigger things later. Have you ever felt like that? Like you were ever sent on some sort of donkey mission? Something that seems minuscule now, but God might use to lead to something bigger in your destiny later? In our upcoming series, we will focus on these donkey missions from some big names in the Bible and how God used them for great things. We're excited for you to join us. Be on the lookout for this series, Donkey Mission. What's the point? Starting soon. Well, awesome. Hey, thank you, everybody, uh, for being here. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, my name is Pastor Mike. I'm one of the pastors here uh, at Connect Church. Pastor Adam is in Florida. <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. Uh, and he's... Uh, he's He's on an amazing trip, and we miss Pastor so much. Uh, I'm, I'm honored and privileged that he trusts me to, to do this while he's not here. Uh, so you guys are in for a wild ride. No, I'm playing. We're going to be good. Uh, hey, uh, this is our normal time of uh, our tithe and offering. Uh, so ushers, if you would like, can you please come forward? If you're going to give my cash or check and you need an envelope, they have those for you. Um, and then uh, we do have a couple announcements real quickly today. The Donkey Mission book is on sale. Now, now this is now this is a an amazing tool that we're trying to put into your hand. This tool will help you to say, "Hey, I know that you have things in your life that you don't feel relates to God, and I don't feel like I'm very like in Christiany sometimes. And sometimes I just all I do is laundry. Uh, this book is going to help you realize that your everyday life." has a purpose. And that's what the whole series is going to be about. And so the books are on sale for four for five dollars. You cannot buy just one. No, you can. But we don't want you to. Because here's what here's what we want you to do. We want you to give this book out to three friends. And and and, and it's I know it's weird like handing somebody a book. Like people don't even read books anymore. Like I have to listen to it online and but this is an amazing tool because it gives them something to hold on to. And I'm telling you, when you're in your darkest, darkest time, you're going to need something to hold on to. And you don't know what people are going through, and this is an opportunity for you to say, let me, let me share something with you that I learned and that we're going to talk about as a church about how to find purpose in your everyday life. That's what this is for. And inside is a little cool card. And, it's, and it just, it just is, tells people what we're going to talk about. I mean, we're going to talk about how to deal with your past. That's a pretty good one. I don't know about you, but the hardest thing for me to do is to forget myself, forgive myself for the things I've done. Yeah, let's, we need to talk about that. We need to talk about excuses, and we're going to talk about friendships, and we're going to talk about so many amazing things. In the next couple of weeks, it, you're not going to want to miss it, and you're going to want to invite your friends because they need to hear the message of Jesus. Amen? So that's on sale today right out in the foyer. They're great. We can do Vimo. You can do cash. You can write a check. You can, I mean, you can, they'll, they'll deal with all that stuff. Uh, and then secondly, we have a men's event coming up. Uh, and men, uh, we, need, we, we need to meet together. Yeah, amen. I, I'm, I'm telling you, the, the, uh, the devil doesn't want men to come together. Because, in all honesty, the world's trying to tear us down more than we can possibly imagine. Because if you're, if you're a man, you're a toxic masculinity. Yeah, I'll let that marinate for a little bit. Right? You know why? Because the devil doesn't want a group of men serving their family, loving God, and committed to a church. Yeah, so you, we need to. We're going to come together. We're going to have fajitas. We're going to throw axes at each other and try to dodge. It's going to be great. My brother one time goes, hey, let's play darts. And I'm like, cool, let's play it. He goes, you don't move, and we'll see who can get the closest. And I was like, cool. <laughs> he told me to go first, so I got really close to his leg. 
he hit me right in the calf. Uh, we're not going to do that, by the way. Wives, don't be alarmed. We are going to have a great time. Uh, we're going to we're going to we're going to bond. We're going to build a, a brotherhood of men coming together. We're going to learn about Jesus. It's going to be great. Sign up for that so we know how much food to have. Uh, you're going to want even bring unchurched friends. I mean, what a great event! That's what these events are for are for us to invite people that don't go to church, who are scared to come to church, who don't like church, let's invite them to get free food and throw axes. I mean, that's pretty good, right? That's pretty good. Okay, so, um, well, let's, uh, when we do our tithes and offerings, we have this uh, confession. We like to pray over our, and say over the things that we give. You know, when you, when you give things, you, you got to give it purpose. You just don't throw money away, right? You give purpose behind it, and this is our purpose as we give our tithes and offerings. As I give my... Through 23, I am healed, blessed. Father, we thank you so much for this time as we come together and we learn about your word and we learn from your word. Father, ultimately, we just give this time for you. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Okay, so what we're gonna we're gonna play a little game because I used to be a children's pastor for about 25 years. I know I don't look like I'm that old, but I really am. So I appreciate you saying I don't look that old, and that's great. Appreciate that. Uh, so we're gonna play a little game. You guys ready? You're gonna tell me who looks like a Christian. You ready? How about the first one? I'll move out the way. Who's the Christian out of that group? No one gets an answer to that. That's cool. No, this is crowd participation. That's okay. Maybe all of them. Let's go to the next one. How about this guy? Can that guy be a Christian? That's me this morning. No way. I'm playing. Huh. What about the next one? Can these, oh, these kids. Which one's the Christian? Are you sure? How do you know? Okay, well, how about this guy? This guy, these guys right here, these guys are Christians, right? I mean, come on. Come on. Those guys are Christians, right? Do you know not necessarily? I'm playing. Okay. This guy, I'm going to tell you, this next one, guaranteed is a Christian. Here it is, right here, right here. Yeah, yeah. He's the best. Be quiet. He's my favorite. He's wearing the best. That's the best team on the world. That's my team. I love that team. And this guy, this next one, he's, he's a sinner. They are going to hell. This is it right here. This is, see, they're evil people. Because Giants and Dodgers, we don't mix. I don't know if you know that. You're going to hear a lot about Giants. I don't like Giants. I just don't like can our prejudice sometimes get in the way of the truth? Okay, let's, get, let's look at the next one. I know that one didn't go over well. You'll get it in a little bit. Okay, how about this? Who's the Christian? The baby. The baby. <laughs> you guys are so sweet. How about this one? Who's the Christian? The ball. <laughs> how about the next one? When I, I searched this logo, and it's super Christian. Is that really a super Christian? Do you know what the world thinks of that picture? Not what you think of this picture. I'm going to let that one marinate for a little bit. Is that really what a Christian is supposed to do? I love that you all said no. Right, let's go to the next one. Can these kids, can these club kids be Christians? See? How about this next one? How about the next one? He is a worship leader. I'm telling you right now, that guy is hip. He needs some skinny jeans, and he's all over it. Gosh, I wish I was that cool and good looking. How about the next one? Can she really be a Christian? I mean, yeah. Do you know in some circles they can't be? How about the next one? That's a weird one. I'm just going to let you know. You know, sometimes we think that we are like undercover Christians and that we can just, we can uh, reveal who we are to our friends uh, when they really need us. Do you know they can tell if you're a Christian or not? So today we're going to be talking about what does it look like to be a Christian. In all honesty, it's one of those vague subjects. See, all of us want to look like a Christian, don't we? Because we're Christians. 
But what does that really mean? Do we have to wear a certain tie? Do women only get to wear skirts? Can men not have a beard? You know, there's a video that went viral of some guy, some preacher, saying, if you have a beard, you're not holy. I am so not holy. <laughs> Thank God. No, I'm playing. I mean, sorry. Right? I mean, I mean, what does it really mean to be a Christian? You see, we all want to come to church and look all pretty and be dignified. I bought new shoes. These are the coolest shoes. They're so light and wonderful. They're fat, too, so my fat feet fit in them, and I wore them just for you. Do you know I think about what I'm going to wear because I want to look cool and I want to look like a pastor, but is that really what a pastor or a Christian is supposed to look like? Do you know we fake stuff to our kids all the time? And your kid knows you better than you can possibly imagine? That's going to be a good day. (laughs) You see, too many times do we want to look like a Christian before we are a Christian. And do you know how you can tell if you're a Christian or not a Christian? It's not by what they see. It's by what you do. You see, you know how you can tell? Because you, people look at you or they watch you. You know there's a difference between looking and watching? I'm going to show you visual aid. You ready? This is my acting debut, and I hope you guys enjoy it. Right here, here we go. That was a look. No, too late. You ruined it. Okay, okay, no, okay wait, wait. That was a look. Here's the watch. <laughs> okay, really, seriously, Pastor Adam will be back. This is, I'm sorry, this may be my last time, so I'm going to go for it. Okay, so seriously, so you know how you can see who a Christian is? It's called you look at their time, it takes time, and you have to judge their actions. It's not by what you look like. It's not how pretty you can pretend to be a follower of Jesus because you say amen once in a while or carry a Bible. I feel so weird. I normally have my Bible with me. I never preach without a Bible, and I don't have my Bible. It's really weird. It's weird, right? And I don't have a belt, which is odd, but you don't need to know that. So really, but how we can determine if someone is a Christian is not how how good you look on the outside. It's what you do that matters. But what is a Christian supposed to do? Are we supposed to yell at people for them acting immoral? Are we supposed to to judge people and tell them what they're doing is wrong? Maybe we're just supposed to be a Christian. Maybe that matters most in the lives of your friends and family and enemies and people that are around you. Maybe they care more about what you do, not how you look. And so we're going to look at that today. We're going to try to figure out what does it mean to be a believer in Jesus Christ. Because the game is over. We can't just look like Christians anymore. There's too much on the line for you to behave and look like a Christian when you really aren't. There are lives on the line, and your children are the ones that are suffering. And that's like spiritual children, that's, that's all of us, because all of us are children. So what you do matters. You can't pretend anymore. Easter is right around the corner, a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There is revival shooting up everywhere in this nation. God is on the move to call his children home. But you are the ones that stop him from doing it. Yeah. Because if we don't love others and we don't do what we're supposed to, God is a respecter of men. So, you have your Bible, let's, let's see one of the last things Jesus tells us to do. 
and we're going to try, try to figure out what the mission of Jesus is because ultimately we got to follow him. Do you know you're called a Christian because you were supposed to be following Christ, not following me? It's Christ Almighty is who we're supposed to look like. So go to Matthew 28. We're going to read 16 through 20. And it says, The 11 disciples traveled to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubted. Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Those verses are categorized as the Great Commission. It is Christ's last words to us before he is taken up into heaven after his resurrection. And these are his last words. This is his last directive to his disciples, and it hinges on two words. The first word is disciple. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? And I wrote a simple little uh, explanation. A disciple is someone who is following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, and is committed to the mission of Jesus, right. A disciple is not somebody who follows the Bible. A disciple is somebody who follows Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. There's a little bit of a difference. You see, it's, and that word following is a continual state. No, you just don't follow him once, take one step, and you're cool with it, and that's it. You know there's more for you. You know salvation isn't the ending point. That's the beginning. God has so much more for you. There's this old uh, rabbinical pro uh, proverb, and I want to sort of tell it to you, and I want you to hold on to it. And it, this proverb says, that may the dust of your rabbi fall on you. Now let me restate it for us Christianese because we're not Jewish. Well, maybe someone's Jewish. I don't know. But, but may you follow Jesus so closely that the dust from his feet fall back on you. That is what it means to be a follower. is that you don't take your eyes off him, what was, was wonderfully stated um, during worship, was put your eyes on Jesus. Follow him. Because what happens when you're following Jesus is change. You, you, you can't stay the same and follow Jesus. You can't think about yourself and follow the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Like, you, you, can't, you can't be arrogant and crazy and mean and manipulative following the greatest servant that has ever lived on this planet. So what was the mission of Jesus? If we're going to follow him. If you go to Luke 19.10, this is it. This is what we as believers are supposed to be. It says, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Do you, like, leave that there for a second. Do you notice it doesn't say to correct and reprimand and beat up and slam them with the Bible because they're not doing what you do? And do you notice it says to seek and save the lost? Do you know Jesus came not to, not to proclaim moralism as a religion? He came to seek and to save the lost. We are set free by the grace of God. And that grace has a name, and it's Jesus Christ. And 
you may be doing things that, that God doesn't like, but that's not my job to tell you. My job is to follow his mission to seek and to save the lost. Because all of us has come to the understanding that all of us are sinners. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us. So if we can just for a second get off a high horse and just be believers in Jesus Christ and follow him, maybe we can start looking like Jesus. And maybe, just maybe, we'll have results like Jesus. You know, we can sum up the mission of Jesus pretty easily. It's in one word. You ready for it? Go. Do you know you're, you, this is not Christianity, just coming to church? This is how you get support. This is how you learn about Christ. This is how you feel That's not Christianity. I knew I was going to get nothing from that. <laughs> this is what believers do. We come together. We don't forsake the gathering of the brethren. This is, this is part of what we are, but that's not, who we, that's not what we do. What you do is when you go to work, you act like Christ. So much so that people go, hey, there's something different about you. And you go, yeah, it's because I follow Jesus. Let me give you a book. No, I don't like <laughs> okay, okay, that was stupid. That was dumb. That was dumb. I mean, can you just imagine what a group of people would just go, how powerful that would be? I mean, think about it. There's, um, there's, what's going on now, there's a movie that just came out, it's called The Jesus Revolution. Yeah, I've been, I have been overly consumed with the history behind this movie. This movie is based upon the last great awakening that America has ever seen. It's called The Jesus Movement. If anybody listens to Christian music, anybody listen to Christian music? Yeah, you need to know all about The Jesus Movement because it was birthed from that movement. It happened back in the late 60s, early 70s when one woman decided she wanted to meet a hippie. She was a pastor's wife. The pastor didn't want anything to do with hippies because they stunk, they smelled like drugs, they slept around, they were disgusting and they didn't shave and they, they were just not the, what the pastor thought people should behave like. But it was his wife that saw a hippie as a person. It was a, it was a wife that went, hey, that person is made in the image of God, and let me meet them. And that's what it took to start a revelation, a revolution, a, an exciting thing that has birthed a movement that we talk about today. Because one person saw somebody who wasn't saved as a person and not a thing. Out of that movement, one man was saved. His name is Greg Laurie. He's a pastor on the West Coast. If you know anything about the Harvest Crusades, he, does, he has taken up the mantle of Billy Graham. Billy Graham has placed his mantle upon Greg Laurie. And Greg Laurie, by himself, has proclaimed the gospel in America to almost 5 million people by himself. With recorded almost 400,000 salvations in the last 30 years. Because one person saw people as people and did something about it, one person got saved, that person has ignited this country. Think for a moment if all of us just got one person saved that we treated one person like a person and we took the gospel to them through love and mercy and grace, which is how you received it. How many of you received Christ as an angry person, as someone yelling at you, telling you not to do what you're doing? Did anybody get saved that way? I did not. 
I got saved because a group of people love me, and I was like, you guys are weird. Leave me alone. And my parents changed. And I was like, there's something wrong with you. You should be beating me. I deserve to be beat. I deserve to be yelled at. And they were like, no. Let me show you Jesus. And I just love him. Just think what would happen. Ponder for a moment. What would happen if you left this place and you go into the world and you start behaving like a Christian? John 13, 34 is the last, it's one of the great commandments that Jesus gives us. He goes, my commandment is this, that you love one another. And they will know you are mine because of your love. Not because of you yelling at people, but because you love them. Well, I love them enough to tell them the truth. Yeah, go tell that to someone else, please. My mom can tell me the truth. You cannot. <laughs> Not really, but you know. But right, it's a relationship that happens. Then you can speak truth to me. Don't think you can just speak truth to someone without a relationship. Are you out of your mind? Like if you yell at someone for doing something wrong, you better know them. If you want to see the result, go to a, gym, go to a jungle gym with a whole bunch of kids and just yell at some random kid. And let's see what happens. You're going to get WWE. There's going to be fighting going on there. So how do we do it? If that's the mission is to go just love people. Like, okay, how do we do it? Let's, okay, what's, what's the mission? I'm, I'm so glad you asked that. Go to Acts 1.8. And this is, I don't know about you, but in my Bible, it was red letters, but I don't have my Bible, so just, it's in red on my iPad. So it's, it's, this is Jesus. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Here is our directive from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But first you got to understand what a witness really is. That word witness is a legal term. It is somebody who stands on a court and gives their testimony something they've actually seen or something that actually happened to them. Not what the other person is doing wrong. It's what God has done inside you, what has God done through you, what you've experienced, how God has set you free. That's what you're supposed to say. That's what you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to look at the other person and go, oh, let me tell you, girl, you don't wear that. Mm, no, that's bad. Don't do that. That's not what you're supposed to do. For a very large reason, that's not what you're supposed to do, especially the way I just did it. You're supposed to give your testimony. You're supposed to tell other people what God's done for you. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the words of our testimony. Not yelling at people. Not correcting other people. Just go love them. So here's what those things, and this is what, so there's, Ju, there's Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and so there's, and, here's, and here's the process I want you to look at. Jerusalem is where they were at the time. So I want you to think about Jerusalem as you taking care of you first. Parents, I know you really want to correct your children on, on when they don't behave like Jesus, but how about if we just behave like Jesus first? How, I, know we, I know we want to like correct people when they come in to church because they're not saved, and you can just tell because they don't look like us, and they're not cool like us, and you just want to tell them stuff. How about you just worry about you first? So Jerusalem, take care of yourself first. Secondly, Judea is 
right next to Jerusalem. And so for me, I look at that, I look at that as, as your family and your close friends. How about you just do a Bible study with your spouse? How about you pray with your spouse? How about you like, get into a Bible study with your close friends and call it a small group and come to church together and, and just talk about sermons and eat food at Laura's house? Because Laura can get down. That's all I got to say. <laughs> so, Laura, are you going to cook for it? No, play, play, play. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Samaria. Do you know Samaria was the enemies of Jewish people? Do you know the good Samaritan was evil in the sight of every disciple? That was, if, like you think, if, they're, if they were racist, it'd be a white person and an African-American person. That's how, much, that's how much tension was between them. Like, it wasn't just some cute little story. It wasn't some casual thing Jesus was doing at the well talking to a Samaritan. Do you know the Bible is emphatic about you loving your enemy? Not judging your enemy? Yeah, I think that's good. And lastly, what about the ends of the earth? Um, I put it as Walmart employees. Because, oh no, I didn't there. It's in my notes. Because Walmart employees need Jesus. I'm just saying, if you're, if you, I'm playing, if you, I mean, if you, if, I'm, I'm, if anybody works at Walmart, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Like, you've got to be nice to the people everywhere. Do you know if you're not healthy on the inside, you'll never be able to help and be nice to other people? Yeah, that's why you got to start with yourself. I want to end you with this story. And it's a story that, um, that I fell in love with, and I hope, I hope, you can, well, it's an amazing story. It's a story about the last living apostle. Does anybody know who the last living apostle was? It's John the Baptist. He was the only one out of the 12 apostles that was not martyred. He was the only one that wasn't killed for his faith in Jesus Christ. He died a very old man. And when he was about... A hundred years old, uh, many theologians believe his, he, was, he lived just a little bit over a hundred years old. He wrote the book of First John. First John is the last written book of the Bible chronologically. He was still alive. About a hundred A.D. is when that book was written. And when John the Baptist, John, John the Baptist, John the Apostle, was very old, he would go to churches and go to gatherings and speak. I mean, how, how awesome would it have been to hear the last living apostle speak? The last eyewitness to see Jesus who died on a cross, went in the grave, came back to earth, and has now risen and went up to heaven like that John. The John that was at the foot of the cross that Jesus said, hey John, there's your mother Mary. Hey John, let me show you what all eternity is going to look like. Let me show you the revelation of Jesus. Let me, let me, that guy. When, when, they, when people would hear he was coming, the gathering was uncountable. People would come from everywhere to hear the last living apostle speak. And he was so old and so frail, he couldn't even walk. People would carry him through the streets, gathering all these people. And I'm going to give you his whole sermon. Are you ready for it? Here's the whole sermon. This is what he would say at place to place, gathering upon gathering. Brethren, love one another. And he would leave. That was it. He was gone. His four guys that would be carrying him around one day go, hey, hey, John, why is that all you say? People want so much more from you. He goes, because if they just love one another, that would be enough. If we could hold on to the love that we have been received from Christ and begin to share it with other people, we will change this world. Our nation is, needs revival. We need to be woken up. We cannot. We cannot stay silent anymore. We have to love people. You have no other choice. If you're going to follow Jesus, 
love one another. Father, we thank you so much for your love. Father, we thank you for this grace that we have received. Father, we ask that you help us, that you cause us to be more and more like you. Father, help us to love one another. Help us to sow the seeds into the life of those around us so they can understand how great and how mighty is your love for them. Father, we ask all these things in your matchless name. Amen. Amen. Let's give Mike, Pastor Mike, a round of applause. You're probably thinking, who's this guy up on stage? Uh, my name's uh, uh, Roger Jackson. You might see my wife, Crystal Jackson. She's been kind of helping out with worship. Uh, I've known Pastor Adam for many, many years. And uh, we have decided to join the church about four weeks ago, and we are going to be serving. We're excited to be here. And, uh, yeah, thank you, guys. And so, and I, I tell you, I, I just love the passion uh, from Pastor Mike this morning. What about you guys? Uh, I think it was awesome. Actually, uh, one of the things I'm going to be helping with specifically, which is a passion of mine, is discipleship. And so I'll be helping around uh, with next steps here at the church and uh, at Connect Church. And, and so... I wanted to communicate to us today, and especially just perfectly going along with this message, is that a lot of times we see that Jesus said, go out and make disciples. And in our minds, we hear this, and I think a lot of it is, we're going to wait for the pastor, we'll bring a friend, and then the pastor will lead them to Christ, right? And the reality is that God has called you and I, you know, I work, I'm not a, I'm not a full-time pastor, but God's called you and I, just, just simple people, right? to go out and make disciples. And a lot of times we're not, we're not called to bring them to the pastor. God has called us to go out there to talk to the world and to connect to the world, to build the relationships with the world. But let me tell you, there's a barrier. And that barrier is the lack of knowledge and not understanding how to lead somebody in Christ. And so that is what discipleship and next steps is all about, is we wanna help people give the confidence and the tools to be able to go accomplish the mission. And without those tools, we will find ourselves kind of stumbling back and, and maybe delegating those responsibilities to those in higher authority or whatnot. But man, the, the beauty is that you and I are called to go make disciples and we can do that. And the only thing we have to understand is understand who Jesus is in our lives. And so um, today, you know, your next step might be like, hey, I, I don't even know who Jesus is. Maybe I need to make a decision for that. Or maybe it's like, hey, I've been waiting for many years to get baptized. Uh, or for you, maybe you're like, hey, it's time for me to st take that next step to go deeper. And so I want to encourage you uh, to, uh, today is that uh, we have a, another friend of mine, uh, Adrian. He's going to be in the back. He's been here at the church for a while. Uh, he's helping out with the discipleship next step stuff. And so uh, he'll be in the back. If you, if you need any prayer, any, any talk, anything that we could help you resource-wise just with next steps, let us know. We'll help you with that. And, uh, and so we're real excited about what God's doing. Remember, Jesus didn't call us to mo go make converts. He called us to go make disciples. And what that means is that we go out and we're fully dependent on Jesus. And, and as we're fully dependent on Jesus, we're, at, we're calling others to come along that journey with us. And so anyways, just want, I want to pray for us and then we'll be dismissed. So, uh, Father, I just thank you uh, for today. Thank you. Lord know that there's a hunger in this room with your people, God, that you are doing a new thing in this place. And so, Father, I just declare in the name of Jesus, Father, that you would move your spirit, move these people, God, to experience the fullness of who you are, that, Lord, that the, the scared and the fear uh, that holds us back from opening up our lips to talk about and to proclaim the good news of who you are, Jesus be silenced, and, and, and Father, that there would be a confidence and a growing uh, curiosity, God, of moving into new places. And so, Father, I pray for our church. I pray for our pastors, God. Help us to be humble, to be hungry, and to be committed to the things you've called us to. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name.